But I just think he's just been so good to me. So good to me. And so my heart is just overflowed. And I'm just really weak. In a good way, though, this morning. You know? But I praise God and I just thank God for all of you beautiful people. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about knowing God personally and personally. I've asked them to put it on the screen. Thank you. So you say, what do you mean? So I just want to spend a few moments just to clarify where it is that I want to go this morning. And so, no, it's not. I'm not just being fanciful when I say personally and personally. And so you will notice that one P has a big P and another P has a small P. So what am I talking about, knowing God personally and personally? I'm talking about knowing the person of God because, you see, God is a person. I see God is a person. So I'm talking about knowing God who is a person. That's what I mean when I say knowing God personally. And I'm also talking about knowing God as me, Sami Badaki, a person. I want to know God as a person. I, I, I Sami Badaki, wants to know God. Would you please, if you will, put back on the screen for me the um, last but one song that we sang? I don't quite remember the title. I want to go over that song again because I do want to point something out to us. Um, if you don't know the song, it's okay. But the song was basically saying that I give you all of my heart. Lord, I give you my heart and I give you my soul. You guys know the song, right? And I have such a difficulty singing that song, and I'll tell you why. I know I haven't fully given all of my heart to God. That's why I have such a hard time singing it sometimes. And so when I'm singing it, I change the words a little bit. And I will say something like, Lord, I want to give you all of my heart. Something like that. The words don't quite fit. But it's amazing how even though I don't totally and fully and completely yield to God, in spite of that, he gives his all to me. How does that not overwhelm a man? I don't know how that doesn't overwhelm you. That I wrong him every now and then. Yesterday, my kids and I were going out and we're in downtown. And you know how hard it is downtown to find your way around? And they didn't quite know where they were going. And I became so frustrated and we had a shouting match in a car. And Grace was going, I don't know why you're so frustrated. And I'm saying, and I'm going, what do you mean you don't know why I'm so frustrated? Now, you know, we're going back and forth. And, and I came away from there and I'm thinking, my goodness. Oh, I'm so glad God isn't like me. <laughs> Amen. So I know I haven't fully given all of my heart to God. I know I have not completely yielded myself to God. But I want to. Do you want to? Yes. So I want to talk to us this morning about knowing God and knowing him in a real and a deep way. And that's not an easy thing to do. I'll tell you what challenge we all as preachers face especially if you're a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you preach the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, here is one challenge you will have every single time you preach Jesus revealed. You're trying to get people to believe what is literally unbelievable. Let me say that one more time, just so you can appreciate where I'm coming from this morning. And you will help me, I hope. I'm trying to get you to believe what is literally what? literally unbelievable and i found that about the only way that can happen is that there will be an atmosphere such that the god of glory himself will come to reveal to you and to imprint imprint upon your heart that with the words of my mouth are impossible to get you to truly believe amen, amen. knowing god personally and personally God is a powerful God. We have no problem with that. Everybody knows that. That God is powerful. He's might. He's mighty. He's just. He's holy. He's beautiful. That God feels all things all the time. God is here right now. Amen. I say God is here right now. Yes. Amen. 
And God is in every place, every single time. He is in Washington, D.C. right now. Amen? He is in the Congress right now. If they're meeting, he's right there. They may not know it, but he is there. Amen? God is everywhere. God is powerful. God is great. God is awesome. And we have no problem believing that. In James, the scripture says, James chapter 2, James chapter 2, verse 9, 19. James, in his, I think, very, very African lingo, says, you believe that there is God, or you believe that there is one God. He said, you do well. He <laughs> said, you believe that there is God, you do well. Big deal. You believe that there is God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So the question is, do you really believe that there is God? And so I want to take us on a journey this morning of knowing God personally and knowing God personally. And I'll be looking in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 25. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 25. You can turn to it, but I want to make a few statements before we go in there, just to set the foundation for what it is that I want to uh, get you to see and what I'm hoping to impart to you this morning. The most important thing about any human being is what comes to mind when you think about God. Let me say that again. I really want you to understand this. The most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when we raise the subject of God, when you think about God, I submit to you that there is nothing more important in the world in human pursuit. Nothing is more significant, nothing more relevant, nothing more needful, nothing more useful than really, truly knowing God. Nothing. Getting a university degree, getting a job, becoming wealthy, nothing is nearly as important as knowing God. And when I say knowing God, I'm talking about the God of the Bible. I'm talking about the God who is the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the God of the Buddhists, and I'm not talking about the God of, uh, of Muhammad. I'm talking about the God who is the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The children said something this morning that I thought was very, very interesting. They said, when you're really, this is not how they said it, but this is where I couched it. When you are inordinately angry or worried about anything, it is because you have either forgotten about the God of the Bible that I want to talk to you about this morning, or you don't know him at all. When you are excessively worried or excessively angry or excessively obsessed about anything, when something completely overwhelms you and takes you to the point where you can't relate with people, now you cannot come to church any longer, no, you don't want anyone to see you, you cannot even get out, it's because you are unaware of the God of whom I'm speaking this morning. Amen? And if you don't know him, even now I want to give you a chance to come to know this God, because he's so good. And I'm serious. If you don't know this God that we're talking about, would you please raise your hand at this time? Just so that together we can invite you into fellowship with God. That you can come into communion with this good God, who is the Father of all, the Creator of all things. Knowing God is by far the most important human activity. So let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. If you please put that on the screen for me. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm going to read from verse 1 through 25. I like the NIV if you can find it. The NIV version. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This is the NIV. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First, for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness 
that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness, all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible, invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men or people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them in their sinful desires of their hearts to a sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies and one another. Don't worry about verse 25. So I want to talk to us today about four things that I see from these scriptures. And the first is that we can know God. Everyone say that with me. Say, we can know God. Amen. We can know God. And the second is that, in fact, we do know God. Say that with me. We do know God. We do know God. And the third is that, paradoxically, we don't know God. Say with me. We don't know God. We don't know God. And the fourth is that we can know God personally. Say that with me. We can know God personally. Say with me. We can know God Personally, So let me go over the four things again. The first is that, in fact, we can know God. God is knowable. All right? The second is that, in fact, we already know God. And the third is that we don't know God at all. And the fourth is that, in fact, we can again know God. I don't know if you have ever wondered before about, in Genesis with Adam and Eve, wouldn't you love to have been there? to really just be able to know God in a personal way like Adam and Eve know God, <clears throat> to really just know that in the cool of the day, in the evening, today, you are going to go home and you are going to be able to physically see and touch God and have a conversation. Are you longing for that? I am. I'm telling you. In some ways, I understand what Paul says when he says that for me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. There is a sense in which every now and then I really want to see God. I mean really see him. Amen? Amen? So I want to show you what I think that in some ways that Paul is talking about in these scriptures. These four things that in fact God is knowable. There's so much argument going on about whether or not there is even God. If you're making that argument, I don't want to talk to you. Quite frankly. If you're still making that argument. Because I tell you. The very sincere atheists who talk about the existence or non-existence of God, even they will tell you that they struggle when they really are sincere with themselves as to really making the claim that God does not exist. Even they will tell you that. The sincere ones will tell you that. What well, the claim is, they don't want God to exist. But God does exist. Say that with me. God does exist. A few weeks ago, I was riding from San Diego going to San Francisco. And I was telling a friend of mine about this experience. How many of you has ever, has ever done that? You've actually motored between San Diego to San Francisco before. Anyone here has done that before? What? Wow. It's an amazing thing to do. I'm telling you. And I was describing this experience to a friend of mine. How we were going, <laughs> and I was... The road suddenly just begins to elevate, Pastor Charles. And we were climbing slowly but surely, and suddenly I was 1,000 feet high. 1,000 feet. You guys know what 1,000 feet is? 1,000 feet, and you're riding high, and I don't like heights. And you know, they actually, they, 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 they had stones that they actually marked, and they tell you when you're 1,000 high. 
1,000 feet high. And they tell you when you're 2,000 feet high. Now, 2,000 feet, I was losing it, I'm telling you. And what made this really, really bad is you can see on the side of the road that you're not where you're supposed to be. He was looking unbelievably deep on that side. And I was grabbing the steering wheel like this, tight. And I was beginning to sweat. But you know what was amazing? 2,000 feet later, 2,000 feet high, I looked in front of me, and it was way higher than I had climbed. And I'm thinking, what? I'm going to have to go even that high? I'm telling you, my mind was in pieces. And I kept going. Cars were zooming past me at 70 miles an hour. I was doing about 65 before then. At this point, I was doing like 45. Like an old man, I was clutching to the end. My friends who were sitting next to me were saying, are you okay? I said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not okay. <laughs> I wanted even volunteer to drive, but they didn't have a U.S. driver's license. I would have let them. We were 4,000 feet high, really. 4,000 feet. Wow. And you looked in front of you, and this mountain spread out. It was gigantic. It was huge. And I felt so small. And I was describing this experience to my friend, and she, she framed it so beautifully. She said, the vastness of the space constrained you. And that's really the way that I felt. If you've ever really seriously been in the presence of this God that I speak, you will know how truly small you are. Oh, we are so small. But here's what God has done. Verse 19, let's go there, that scripture. In all of nature, God deliberately has made himself known. Give me verse 19. Romans 1. Give me verse 19 of that scripture again. God has deliberately made himself known so that nature points to the very existence of God with much evidence all around us. And so Paul says, what may be known about God is what? It's plain. God has deliberately made himself known to all of us. The first time I went on a cruising um, uh, Ship, the majesty and the size of that boat just overwhelmed me. And if you've had, ever, ever gone on a, on a cruise before, you know what I'm talking about. 4,000 rooms on a boat that is going to float on water. And you get on that boat and it's floating on water and you look to your left and you look to your right. And there's no end to the vastness of the ocean. And you're telling me that there is not a God? You're crazy. It's plain. Even if you're blind, you know there is a God. There was an atheist that kept saying that there is no God in there. He heard Beethoven. I heard, oh, there's got to be a God. You hear some music and it just does something to you. And you know, th there is something beyond the human. This can't be man-made. There's got to be some agency outside of me who is organizing stuff. Amen? Amen? God has made himself plain. He's made himself known. So that's the first point. That's how we can know God. Because God, in fact, using nature, has pointed to the very existence of himself with a lot of evidence. Secondly, I want to submit to you that we also do intuitively know God. I'm not just talking about the evidence that surrounds us, but I'm saying intuitively we also know that there is a God. We know this very basically. Not just through reasoning, not just through uh, a, a, a natural deduction, not just through the things that are plain for all to see. But the Bible tells us, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity, you see, in the hearts of men, the Bible says. God has hardwired 
into our hearts. There are certain impulsions and there are certain emotions and there are certain feelings that you have that just let you know that there is a God. There are certain things that just happen to you and you just, as the Bible describes, you become still and in that stillness, you know that there is more than what surrounds you. You know that there is more than what you see. You know that there is more than what you feel. Are you feeling me? You know that there is more than the things that you can touch and the things that you can taste and the things you can smell. God has hardwired our hearts and our minds and our emotions. And we intuitively know that there is a God. And this leads me to the third point, which is that, in fact, we don't know that there is a God. And that sounds funny. How can I know that there is a God and I don't know that there is a God? So all the things around us point, point to the existence of God. Intuitively, because God has planted eternity in the hearts of man, we also know intuitively that there is a God. But yet, yet, by the things that we do sometimes, and the things that we say sometimes, we in fact act as if there is not a God. How many people were here last Sunday? Did you see and remember the video that Pastor Charles shared with us? How is it possible that that will happen in modern day United States? How is that even possible? And I saw someone say, I think Revelation sent me another video sometime during this week. And it was a variation of that video. And essentially what it was showing was this guy who was spending money on buying the uh, fish symbol on his car. You know, he's going to church and he has the t-shirt on that says Jesus is Lord. And, you know, he's got all the gear and he's got all the lingo and he's got all everything. You know, this is a Christian man. And he's on his way to church or someplace, I don't know. And there's right beside him this person who clearly, clearly, very obviously needs help. But he just goes right past him. I know I do that sometimes. I don't know about you, so I'm just going to fess up right now and have you all pray for me. By our very action sometimes, we tend to suggest that there is not a God. And why do we do this, the question is. Why, 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 how can I know that there is a God and yet act like there is not a God? i tell you what I found. The simple reason, in my opinion, is because you don't want to give up control. That's simply the reason why sometimes you almost don't want there to be a God. I don't know if someone has ever wronged you before and your mind is just made up. There is no, nobody is going to stop me from dealing with this brother or with this sister. I'm going to take my pound of flesh. You ever felt like that before? You know what I'm talking about? In that moment, please let, not there, let there not be a God. And if God is shouting and screaming, that, God, please, this is between me and this person. This has nothing to do with you. I need to let them know they've done this long enough. Have you said that before? Enough is enough. What are you really saying? I got to take control. I got to take charge. I'm in charge. Are you? Really? I know in my life, as recently as a day or so ago, I was having an eternal conversation with God where I was telling him, listen, you just don't know. And isn't God good? That's why Jesus had to come. So I cannot tell God you just don't know. That's why God himself had to come in the person of his own son. So that the Bible tells us that there is not such a thing that touches you that he's unaware of. Why? He's been there, done that. Oh, I love Jesus, I'm telling you. He's not untouched by the feeling of my infirmity. So if I'm feeling it, he's felt it before. So I can go to him and say, you know what, Jesus... I don't know how you do this, but I'm telling you, I, 
I need help. <laughs> help me. He's been there before. He's done that before. You are not in charge. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who we're talking about should a person really, what, what, what is too much? How much is too much? If, I'm, if I buy a jacket for $100, is that too much money to spend on a jacket? Someone says yes. So, so what do you think of, of spending $1,000 on a jacket? Yeah, exactly. That was exactly my reaction. This is a joke. I mean, this man is sitting on tens of millions of dollars. You don't have cable? Not only does he not have cable, it was the reason he didn't have cable that flawed me, that will make me never forget the story till I die. He said, you know how much cable cost? <laughs> yes, of course I know how much cable cost. I know how much cable costs. I have cable. <laughs> he said, what cable cost me a month will fund a missionary in, and he named the city every month. Oh my God. <laughs> what? So, this question for me is really a personal one. Because the Bible tells me, for him, to know, for him that knoweth to do good, and does it not. No, it's not just a sin. To him, the Bible is clear. To him, it is sin. So, I had a conversation with God, and I said, God, I, I really like a Tesla. And it's going to be about $100,000. And I'm confident God says, go on, son. So I'm going to be riding a Tesla. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. But here is the thing. Here is the thing. Here is what I'm saying to you. At the end of the day, even though you think so, you're not really in charge of your own life. You went to sleep last night and you woke up this morning and you don't know how. We're deceived into thinking that we really have control. That we're really in charge when we're really not. And so every now and then we act in such a way as though to say that there is not a God, but there is God. And he is alive. And he was here this morning, and he is here right now. He lives in me. I carry God. Every now and then I act like I don't. Last night or yesterday in the car with my children, I was acting, like, I was acting a fool. I was acting like there is not a God. And this morning I woke up and I called my girl and I said, I'm sorry about yesterday. Amen? And that's what you want to do. When the, that's why I asked you earlier on, what comes to you when you remember God is the most significant thing about you. It's not just what you do. When you know you haven't done right, what do you do? Do you then make it right? When God speaks to you, do you then acknowledge that and act upon that which God has said to you? Because if you don't, what you're doing is you're making the voice of God less and less audible until there, there's coming such a time when, even though he's screaming and shouting, you don't hear him anymore. You don't want that to happen. Say, that will never happen to me. In Jesus' name. I want to go to the first point, and then I want to round up. How can I know God? Personally, how do I know God personally? God is my friend. That's not a statement that you can make in any religion. In fact, when Jesus came and he said, Abba, Father, the Jews frowned at him because they knew God as this very distant God with who a man really, you can't really know him. And it was almost disrespectful to speak about God in that wise, to say, Abba, Father, to call God my papa. But he's my papa. That's right. You know, there's something affectionate when you don't just say, he's my father. When you begin to say, he's my papa. 
You know? There's something personal about that. Don't you know what I'm talking about? When you're beginning to understand and really know God, and even though there's evidence in nature that talks about God and the existence of God, until you know God in the way I'm about to describe to you, you cannot really believe him. And here's where the rubber meets the road. And if you don't believe God, even though God is in existence, even though there's more than ample evidence to suggest that there is God, you cannot really believe him, even though you may say you do. Because all of power, all of the power that you see, all of the greatness and the grandiose and the majesty that you see, like the one that I described to you, really means one thing. The love of God. The power of God. The majesty of God. The awesomeness of God. Even the, 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 the beauty of God in songs and in poetry and so forth and so on, don't necessarily reveal to you the love of God. So how do I know God personally? Very simply. Look to the cross, my friends. That's how you know God personally. That's how you know the God of love. That's how you know that God loves you. That God isn't just tripping when he made all these things and just wanted to impress himself. When you bring it down to bear and you really look to the cross, you begin to really know God personally. Amen? Amen. You have to look through the gospel at the cross. And this is the only way that you will truly come to know God. I want to tell you this morning, I don't know who you are or what's going on in your mind. Whatever you're feeling, if you're going through some pain right now, may I suggest to you that God feels your pain right there where you are? Whatever thought's going on in your mind right now, God already knows it. Amen? I'm arriving at a place in my life by the grace of God, and I'm asking you to come to this place where you can talk to God and be naked with God about everything that's going on in your life. No matter what it is, good, bad, ugly. Where you break the barrier down and you can talk to God about your very feeling. God, I'm feeling like doing some really terrible thing right now. That's how I talk to God. That God, this is what I feel like doing right now. And you know what I've noticed? If I would just cast my mind back to the cross, I don't know how that happens. There's just an overwhelming feeling of emotion and power that come at the same time that just steadies me and points me right. And you just go, I don't even know why I want to do that. The feeling just leaves you and evaporates. And I just bow in the awesomeness and the praise of this beautiful God, this awesome God. Because in the cross, he himself came to say, I know you can't do it. I know you don't have the resources. I know you don't have the power. I know you cannot satisfy me. I know you cannot fulfill the law. I know you cannot live sinless. So I'm going to come in the cross and I'm going to take it all on and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to pay the price. I will not only pay, but I'll pay it in full. I will not only give you, but I'll give you more than enough. I will not only save you, but I will save you to the uttermost. I will not only deliver you, I will deliver you from your sins. I will deliver you eternally. I will deliver you permanently. That's the God I'm talking about. In the cross, he reveals to me that he loves me totally and completely. And that he loves me for me. Not because I know Pastor Bank. Not because I come to what I reach out for all nations. But that he loves me for me. That God loves Sammy Badaki. Oh my God, that overwhelms me. That just overwhelms me. And when I know God loves me, I know it's going to be okay. Yes. Yes. Because there's no one that has more power than God has. There's no situation that's bigger than God. So when I know God loves me completely and fully, I know whatever it is I'm going through, no matter how hard it is, I know it's going to be okay. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God wants you to know him this way. Yes. He wants you to know him as the God who loves you. Will you rise to your feet? Hallelujah. 
Haleluya. Uf. There's something about singing that ordinary words really can't do, so I just want to go back to that song that we sang. The darling of Jesus, uh, the darling of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. And I want you to sing this song with meaning in your hearts. I want you to really focus on Jesus Christ and to set your eyes and your focus on the cross. That should have been you. That should have been me on the cross. But he came and he bore my sin. He bore all of my iniquities. He took them away permanently and completely and forever, for eternity. That I never have to worry about it. So I can just leave saying, thank you, Jesus. That every day I can just say, thank you for that which you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. There is so much that God has done for us that if we just talk about that alone for the rest of our lives, we will not really be able to unravel all of that which God has done for us. The Bible tells us that he has prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He says he has anointed your head. You are the anointed of God. Say, I am anointed of God. Anointed of God has set you apart for his use. He's given his life to you. You know, we like to say every now and then, oh, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. And I'm just saying to you, even if you have, he gave his life to you first. And he didn't just give you any life. He gave you eternity. Life with God. Reconciled you back to God. So God wants you to know, you and I to know, that we can touch him once again. Like Adam touched God, we can touch God again. Like he saw God, we can see him again. That's available to you, my friends. Jesus Christ. We fill this room, every heart in this room, oh God. Hallelujah. With the vastness of your love. We bask in the ocean of your grace. We come to that very deep place in you because your grace is the deepest part of you, O oh God. We want to experience you. Not just your power, not just your majesty, and your powerful. But we want to see you as a personal God. Who loves us enough to give everything up that we might have a relationship with him. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Seized on the throne. Sing it like you mean it. We cry, we cry now, now with many crowns in victoria. Darling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. If you're here this morning, as we just take the song down a little bit, if you're here this morning, and you don't know this God. You have never really experienced God as a loving God of grace that has completely forgiven you no matter how bad your sins are. He says, come this morning, come today and experience love. The kind of love that is so deep that the mouth cannot even experience ex express it. I invite you this morning to come to know this Jesus. He's the darling of heaven. He was crucified for you and I. 
He's made abundant life available for you and I. If you don't know him, would you come this morning that we might bring you and usher you in into your very destiny beginning this morning. Would you hear this call? Would you come now? Would you accept him? And if you know God, but you feel like he is far away from you, you're already born again, but you're not feeling the tangible presence of, of God in your life any longer. I also invite you this morning, would you please just come, that we can pray and revive life, eternal life, into you. Jesus said, I'm come that you may have the abundant life that's available for you this morning to take care of whatever your circumstance, whatever situation you're in. If you want this because you feel separated from God, even though you may have been born again, would you please just quickly come that we can pray together and usher you into this beautiful, awesome, glorious life called eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Just of God. The darling of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Lord, I want to thank Worthy you. is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy. Seated on the throne. You are seated. delivered your word as you've asked me to and I thank you that you will do that which I cannot do take this word and as many as will mix with faith in their hearts my God thank you that you are doing an eternal work in the hearts of all of us together that together Lord will be strong in yielding to you knowing that you have loved us with an everlasting love and in return that we will love you back we praise you, we adore you, in Jesus' name.